today is uh, absolutely the final vote on a uh, cleaned up document. Uh, so we'll just make that transmission in the next couple of days. Very good. And maybe you disseminated a letter you see received from the, the dispensaries. Um, it just goes back to our conversation last time regarding whether or not we want to recommend that dispensaries put aside a specific baseline of products or biomass. Um, the dispensaries still feel strongly that it's better that we recommend biomass um, rather than products with the uncertainty in the rules of not knowing what the product um, packaging or labeling requirements or testing even for that matter might entail. Um, you know, it could add additional cost to some products that dispensaries are already losing money on, and there is some concern that they would be, um, you know, it would just basically be a threat to the bottom line. Um, I did go back and I asked uh, the dispensaries in general, you know, how much biomass is finished product, how much is work in progress, and really they all vary so much depending on the product and the shelf stability of the product that I I also am I understand the desire to uh, commit to biomass rather than products because some of those products aren't shelf stable beyond you know a, a few weeks or something like that so I, I do see those difficulties um, and so I think that's number 14 in our recommendations yeah, and um, I'm having difficulties in the share screen, so I'll just I'll, I'll read from the Meg uh, obtained from the Ramon Cannabis Trade Association. Uh, for the reasons listed below, the medical dispensaries ask that we commit to a three-month supply of biomass based on the average of the previous three months' sales. Uh, commitment to biomass will provide flexibility the dispensaries need to capitalize on efficiencies that support our ongoing businesses. Commitment to biomass based on previous month's sales will ensure the dispensaries are reserving an appropriate amount of product based on real data. And if the medical program expands, so will the amount of reserved biomass. So it's a <clears throat> it, it's it's that will be a rolling number based on based on sales. And then the medical program will have new rules that will likely influence testing, packaging, labeling, et cetera, and certain products are already made at loss. Committing to producing certain items and new requirements could result in even greater financial loss. So that's the reasoning behind uh, the biomass. And then just as a reference point, there's no surprise, but they list the top selling product categories, uh, confections, baked goods, that includes the cookies, brownies, gummies, candies, uh, flour and free rolls, baked cartridges, tinctures and um, topicals. So we will certainly pass that along to the board as well with respect to our number 14. Um, and then, I mean, the rest of the time we'll spend discussing and finalizing the revised list that I'm sure there's still some discussion points on. And then from there, I think we're ready. I will have a more formalized recommendation report um, that everyone can uh, we can begin working off of so uh, depending on how today goes I think this might be our our final in-person meeting um, before we start working on the document okay good go ahead uh, yeah I just, I, you know again I'm not I have a comment on the, the document from the trade association I mean sure. I Again, again, I'm saying this with, without necessarily uh, a pathway for, for how to proceed from this, but, you know, I have to say the bullet point number three is both honest and also expresses my deep concern about this whole, uh, you know, issue here, that in fact, you know, there are going to be new rules and it is going to be a different world, but what this doesn't say, there's also going to be a whole new market and different economics for the entire business, not just the medical part of it, that the dispensaries are getting integrated licenses because of their prior commitment to this program. So, you know, when we get to the bulleted item number three, it's very honest. If you commit to these products, uh, it is possible that you'll lose money or not make the money uh, that is potentially made 
by not prioritizing a medical product over a adult use product when the time comes. So, you know, I appreciate the honesty of it, but it still it concerns me, and I don't see really much of a, you know, I, I you know, I feel like we're in a position that uh, is is somewhat perilous uh, for the medical firm. There's so many unknowns, and I just I don't see any language that even really in here talks about prioritizing, you know and that type of commitment. And I, I, I think if we're not gonna really, you know, I, I'm curious that there's a list of products that are top selling, if they're not money making, you know, products, what, what the problem is, I would assume if they're top selling and not money making, then it's something to be looked at. But uh, I just, I wonder whether there's a way that we can, you know, put in some language to go on record that you know commits to prioritizing uh, things so that we don't get in a situation where you know just as you wouldn't want to go to a doctor's office or a, a, a pharmacy and you know uh, say I, I need the medication that I've been taking for so long and somebody says well we'll have it in two weeks right. you know it's not going to be a good situation now uh, I understand that we're probably not going to move you know very far to a, a complete a guarantee of all these things, but uh, to me, this language, you know, tells me to worry. So I would like to at least go on the record as having said that uh, I appreciate the the intent that's gone into this, and think that if there's any way to uh, put into words at least the commitment to prioritize, then you know I think that we might be uh, moving things in a better direction, and obviously they'll just have to be. Uh, you know, it's a good thing we'll have the oversight committee in, in the spring, uh, but I'll just leave it at that. I understand where they're coming from. So, Jim, I, I do agree because I do understand the anxiety around it, and I think the dispensaries in general aren't necessarily saying with that third bullet point that they would cease making those products by any means, just that if, um, if they were told, you know, you have to have X amount on hand between the cost associated, and I, just to be clear, my understanding is that the top product categories do not, um, those aren't necessarily the products that aren't um, making any money. There, you know, those are just for our refer, our reference for that baseline of products. Um, but yeah, with regard to that third bullet point, my understanding is they don't intend to stop making those. They just don't want to be um, held to having a you know a certain amount of those, knowing that maybe that doesn't sell or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, my, my my guess is that the, the products that are making money are potentially the very high potency uh, products within one of those categories. Maybe it's a very high potency edible, um, or but just doesn't have. For whatever reason, the, the demand right now, um, or just isn't, it isn't cost effective for them. But the, so the, the commitment is to three months of, of biomass based on the sales. And yeah, the, the trick here, Jim, is, and I know you said you didn't have a resolution to it, but yeah, that's the challenge. What what do we put in the recommendation to the board? Um, in order to kind of secure what you're saying is prior prioritization, um, because it, clearly they don't want the dispensaries don't want to be pigeonholed with numbers and, and, and products. Um, but if, if what you're saying is in the vein of you know suggestions of prioritization, I mean that, that that's the language that that we're going to have to strike and find uh, when we. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't have it either right now, but that's that's what we need to develop for number 14. Yeah, I, I did ask, you know, the dispensaries about if, you know, would it be a list of the top products or, you know, how could you come up with that? And one of the things I heard was kind of how frequently that list changes. Um, and it's certainly something that was uh, uh, very subject to change throughout the pandemic. Uh, there was a shift in what people were purchasing, you know, less of the higher concentration, more volume, and it 
I think that's also where some of the concern comes with saying, okay, we're going to have X, Y, Z when those items very really could change. Um, yeah, it's hard without really knowing the details to comment on it because, I mean, during the pandemic, everybody got scared of vape pens because of news, you know, that was all kinds of stories that were going around that I couldn't say are particular necessarily to the time period or or what and I, I get I get all that which is why you know I understand I don't want to be pigeonhole uh, you know but I think the language at the very least needs to reflect more of the desire uh, from you know medical oversight from medical patients from the cannabis control board to feel that the medical programs product uh, channels are reliable and and that the patient can count on a treatment that uh, is suitable for a medical patient as opposed to suitable for a recreational customer and so those are intent about intent and commitment and this is a great internal document and perhaps though we just need language but for the recommendation that like I'm just trying to do just goes on record and just says you know, it's about a commitment to put put a medical patient first when money is coming at you. And also, to be fair, things like this, new regulations, new requirements. Uh, but that's part of what the, the business that we're, we're, I think, in here. So, uh, you know, I think what I'm talking about is realistic and pragmatic, but looking for uh, just the language to express that intent. Meg, can I ask? Um briefly just uh the three month supply um was that um just what what was the decision yeah process behind that so currently that's roughly what um the dispensaries have on hand that is a balance let me just pull up i have a excel spreadsheet here with all of the specifics but um depending on the product you know we may have a back stock of a month or two all the way up to um, three to six. It really just depends on what the product is. So the three months is really an average of kind of all of that between the work in progress, finished goods, um, and that has been effective until now, the um, three months. And you know, it's uncommon, as, at least in my understanding, that there's um, specific products that there's been a shortage. I do realize there's a lack of diversity with um, different flower strains, but in terms of products, my understanding is the three months has kind of kept a steady supply. Okay, yeah, I just, the reason I ask is because a lot of the other recommendations from this committee, the, um, the 14 points or so, um, really uh, open up the mark, the, the kind of medical patient, kind of the very narrow um, eye hole that like regulates the patient registry. And so I'm wondering if, in all I, I'm singularly focused on ensuring that the current patients have access to the things that they've grown to rely upon. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about reciprocity, if we're talking about um, you know adding conditions, if we're talking about expanding the number of people um, is three like we just have to make sure that the current patients are kept whole um, or unharmed by this change. Um, so I'm just wondering if those dynamics suggest that we should wait uh, to expand the patient. You know, some of these things that we're talking about reciprocity um, and um, the three month relationship with the uh, healthcare provider until after this transition to adult use happens just that the current patients are not harmed. I would say if anything, growing the program now ideally will result in being able to make some of these products at volume, which will ultimately you know, benefit the dispensaries financially and in the end um, ensure that those products are still there. Yeah, I, I would have to agree that I think to it's a fine balance right now because I think to create any more situation 
where it's not easy to access the registry, or I should put it another way, to not loosen up the the, the challenges, I think, to uh, becoming a medical patient, and that especially <laughs> things like a three-month relationship and whatnot that really are a challenge. It's already you know, nothing like the states where you go and get a medical card. It's way more complicated, uh, more paperwork, more days involved. So, you know, and I think the other side is that my gut feeling, and I know that we've heard this from, uh, I think, either Meg or Virginia, that it's likely that it's, you know, the possibility of, of patients dropping off uh, precipitously with adult use because there's a certain class of patient who's going to be like, you know, I'm using cannabis in this way, and if I can get it through adult use, I don't really need uh, to, you know, go through this process. So I am a little concerned if we don't, you know, move ahead with some of those things at least, like that three-month relationship, uh, that, that aren't going to, you know, something that's going to make it easier for people to, to get into the program. Yeah. I just, I just think that if you double the amount of patients overnight because you've greatly expanded the access point, um, whether that three months is actually one and a half months to supply, or if you allow a one ounce per visit, you know, purchase cap versus one ounce per month, whether that three month supply is actually a lot less, you know, in the end, functionally a lot less. I mean, we saw in 2018, the drastic drop in, uh, participation and prior to that I think we were still following that same guideline of roughly three months and we've never experienced some like massive shortage in any way and I just I would yeah I would agree with Jim I would be nervous to not increase the program I think we've waited a long time and we the more participation we can get is ultimately going to benefit all of the patients in it one thing that I would add to that though is that I think in almost every burgeoning adult use market, we've seen shortages and we've seen supply run very thin. Now, it might be a slightly different here in New England, given the you know multitude of states that have gone adult use at the same time and the you know the ease of, of going over to another state uh, by the customer or the patient, uh, you know. So, I, but I think it is possible that, you know, again, that speaks to prioritizing. And I think it does make the question that Pepper's asking about the three month supply. When I think about it, that's what does make me nervous. You know, that right here at the beginning, uh, it just is an unknown. We don't, we really don't know. Uh, and uh, the patient can't be the, the you know, guinea pig. Uh, on it. So, you know, the one thing I, I also want to add in is that, that uh, even though there's never been a situation where probably the products themselves aren't there, there isn't a patch or a concentrate, there often, or I should say many times, haven't been a basic two different strains, a sativa dominant versus uh, 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 you know, indica, and I think that for a lot of medical patients, that's a major, major consideration. We just lost a board member uh, from one dispensary to another because of that particular Indica versus Sativa uh, need. That is something I would hope that with the you know a large canopy, the no limitations for the integrated license holders in terms of plant count, that we can ensure that there'll be you know, both of those basics. Um, but that has been where it's been a little more than just the variety, but uh, somebody like me, I, I, I don't, uh, an Indica won't help me. <laughs> so it could be a challenge. Anyway, just adding that in there. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. One of the other items I wanted to bring up was, um, I think it's, let's see, point number, Maybe along with point number 13, um, I think also to ensure no shortage of product, we should remove the four ounces of usable cannabis that is in the existing law. 
um, I believe it's section 3A, cultivate and possess at any one time, and then um, they go down to list what the dispensaries are able to have. Um, and I think we should remove that four ounce limit. Also, I think that just going back to um, our previous discussion with uh, product commitment, we should look at the Massachusetts law. Um, I know that there is something in there about their commitment to serving medical patients first. Um, and I think that language may assist in finding what it is we're looking for. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, I'm just jotting that down the board document instead of a napkin like I did last time. Lost. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think um, what Chairman brought up was a, was a good point. Here are my suggestions because I, I, I think what we're, he's right, what we're trying to avoid is not maybe shortchanging ourselves given the growth in the market that may happen with, with the transition. Um, so my suggestions are to, we, we can write in the recommendation to revisit um revisit that three month biomass uh time limit within a certain by, by a certain date and then the, the second part of it is when we're talking about collection of data on vmr access i mean i think it's a separate point but created like another point 13 to collect to recommend the integrated license holders uh, continued collection of data on medical consumption um, to help us calculate whether or not to increase that, that three month time frame. Um, and those might help kind of alleviate some of your concerns, Chairman Pepper, without delaying the action of, of the other items that, that we have on here. Yeah. Is that sense? That, that's good. Yeah, to be clear, I, I don't want to delay them at all it's really just this idea that the folks that have come to depend on these med these medicines and their processes to get them um, should be the most protected um, and you know if that means holding back some of these things uh, for a little while that makes sense to me but i really don't want to i think that everything that this committee has talked about are common sense and especially when you think about how restrictive the program has been or the last decade, you know, it's it's more than time to to rethink it. Um, but you know, I, I just I have that focus on the current patients, just like you know, I know you do, Meg and Jim as well. Sure. I will say, I think also, if we were to delay, if anything, I think giving um, the current integrated licenses that have these few months to focus on really getting the medical program to a place that everybody is satisfied with prior to adult use will be really beneficial. I would, I think I would rather see that versus um, having adult use and this kind of newly, uh, this new, the new rules for the medical program roll out at the same time. Okay. Um, Meg, other points you wanted to go through on the revised draft recommendation? Nope, that's it. Um, you just, I did notice one thing. It might be a typo in item number six. I'm sure that is. Uh, the list of qualifications of the medical registry should include anxiety and sickness disorders. I'm sure what that. I, I got it. Not that actually from the minutes because I lost my napkin note from from last time. Um, I, I, yeah. think, I think you had that. I think it was sleeping. Minute list. Yeah, I think it's sleep disorders. Sleep, sleep, sleep That's sleep what disorders. I thought. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Other suggestions or recommendations? Time. Okay, well, let me um, let me work on making this a more formalized recommendation list, uh, including. Oh, 
If I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just looking back at number six. I thought we were also adding uh, opiate use disorder or the or opioid prescription. I think. Yeah, we did talk about that. I'll add that. Okay. I think the the other suggestion was the idea of uh, it, uh, the medical program being recommended upon an initial prescription of opioids was was maybe the direction we were talking about. take public comments now anyone in the room has a has a comment or a question in Vermont thank you no I don't think anyone's here but oh, okay all right thank you very much um, Thanks. And yes, <laughs> I will uh, I will work on formalizing this recommendation and sending it off to you folks for and then we can start the red line process that sound good great and if anyone's going to be out in uh las vegas for mj biz this week we've got a booth and i'll be on a panel and meet up at an after party or whatever just uh send me a note okay Thanks, Tom. All right. Yes, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.